Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. The man who said this had considerable leadership experience to draw from. John F. Kennedy led men in combat, led a nation in turmoil, and paid the ultimate price as a leader. Whether you pursue a career in wildland firefighting or go on to a different profession, becoming a student of leadership will pay lifetime dividends to you and those you work with. Many of you are on the threshold of a difficult transition from follower to leader. You're preparing to lead those that were once peers. Why do you want to be in charge? Why would anyone want to follow you? Are leaders born or made? What can you do to become a better leader? Every firefighter who makes this transition will make mistakes. That's part of the learning process. But trial and error is not the only way to learn. The effective leader will search out and take advantage of many opportunities in their journey toward mastering the art of leadership. This training course is just one such opportunity. More opportunities will be handed to you by time and circumstance. Studying the actions of those in critical leadership roles is one way you can improve your leadership skills. In August of 1949, the wildland firefighting profession experienced one of the most significant fire tragedies in our history. Twelve smoke jumpers died at the Man Gulch fire in Montana. The aftermath of that fire caused changes within the wildland fire profession that still affect us today. Now, more than 50 years after that fire, business leaders, Marine Corps officers, and wildland firefighters have gathered in Man Gulch for an event known as a staff ride. This is another leadership teaching tool. After completing a pre-reading assignment, participants go on site to walk through an incident and stop at strategic sites to discuss critical leadership actions. With each person contributing their insight on what they believe were crucial factors, the whole group gains a better understanding of the incident. We, we teach our people how to size up fires, we train them, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about it and doing it, but what do we really give them to help size up their people? especially when they've never yeah. been around them before. Just to play with that a little bit for the uh, sort of the immediate setting here, let's say it is 5 o'clock. You were thrown onto that aircraft. You still don't know all the names. Here you are. Somebody has told you, <laughs> size up your people before you begin to move. What would you have done right here at that time to begin that process? One of the first things you learned as a beginning firefighter was how to select a hand tool to take a few seconds to examine it and see if it's fire ready before heading out to the fire. The same is true now that you aspire to be a leader of firefighters. Knowing the capabilities of the individuals on your team is at least as important as your knowledge of tools and tactics. Always remember the basic test of leadership. Only the willing decision by others to follow you makes you a leader. Deciding to follow was a key factor at Man Gulch. Within two hours of landing on the ground, the smoke jumpers' situation had deteriorated, and their goal of escape by outrunning the flames was eluding them. It was at this point that Wag Dodge, the leader of the group, initiated his successful escape fire and attempted to get the others to follow him into it. The decision by his firefighters not to follow him at that critical moment had tragic consequences. To get this past this point, the crux of uh, keeping this team alive is that very fateful moment somewhere after 5.50 when Dodge says, uh, <laughs> in here, everybody. And at that point, his own leadership did not seem to uh, still be there, at least enough to get Sally and Rumsey and, or anybody else, for that matter, to, to follow on in. So working backwards from that, one way to think about this spot here is this. What are you doing at this point that might be right, might be wrong, that will then fatefully affect whether you can lead about 15, maybe 20 minutes later when it's really going to count? If you need, need a, uh, a co-conspirator, a, a buddy, a, uh, an executive officer, a deputy, uh, you really need to get to know that person 
especially if that person's the natural leader or the, the credible leader in the group. So just in hindsight, it might have been good for uh, Dodge to take uh, the XO and go up and do the recce together. So they could have conspired, thought about this, and then left somebody else in charge of lunch. Yeah. Made a simple statement like, if you think I'm missing something or not seeing something, let me know. Thank you. Uh, a good example would be the uh, destruction of the American Embassy in Beirut on the 18th of April in 83. All of a sudden, the American Embassy gets blown up and, well, we're loading boys on trucks and driving up there and nobody knows where we're going or why we're going there. Uh, but you get down there and, hey, kind of got to make a mess of all of that, and you got the media, and you got uh, all of these things. Uh, one thing I found is to get small groups together and assign projects to them. And uh, just a little thing as important as putting your arm around someone who you're the leader of that small unit who's going to go off and do something, and you just explain uh, the situation there and then send them off on their project. And then the next group you send off on their project, you explain what you did with the first group. Yeah. All right, Sergeant Kaiser is going to go down there. He's going to provide security on, on the wharf. Okay, what I need you to do is go around the back side of the building and make sure nobody sneaks in to steal documents and stuff. And, you know, I'm going to be here and we'll link up later. Okay, yeah. yeah. Kaiser's doing this. The Nazis is doing this. You know, I need you to do this. Yeah. And that small unit project assigning uh, seems to be real important. Had I said more about the gravity of the situation up there, it might have worked to my advantage as we're heading down the gulch, others beginning now to try to solve the problem with me as they can appreciate how serious the situation is uh, becoming. And then at this critical moment, a few minutes after 5.50 p.m., as I say, uh, basically, in here, everybody, I might have had a little bit more of a tug on them. Their leadership, their confidence in my leadership might have been a little bit stronger at that point and might have made the difference. So. That actually ties into the one that I think is the most critical. Dodge needed to take a couple of minutes while he was establishing his legitimacy as a leader to explain his thoughts about how they were going to proceed over the next hour or two so that he had some buy-in from his crew for the basic plan of attack. There's my... <laughs> list of great lessons here. One is uh, a reminder, strategy is everything. Dodge developed a strategy here to get these guys out, got his priorities straight on that one, obviously. But equally, time of execution is everything, too. And Tom made a nice observation there. The things were running about 30 minutes behind where they should have been. And slowness of execution is, without question, going to let somebody else get the high ground before you get there in business or anywhere else. So. Great strategy, but you also have to have speed of execution. Third point I've got here is that words really count. Not always, but sometimes they really do. Got to be careful how we use words with people who are looking to us for guidance. Need to make certain they hear what is intended. Words shouldn't be ambiguous. I think a good phrase that I've just heard maybe it ought to be applied to just about everything we, we say and do, and that is the, the this and why, this is why phrase, or this, the, the, this is why. So whatever the instruction is, here's why we should do that. This is why we're going to do that. Next point is not only do words count, but behavior counts. And people often look to what you're doing as much as what you're saying. I think we know that pretty well. And by way of illustration here, Dodge coming back up here to grab a bite to eat, at least taking time in the minds of the men who are heading out, he's not coming out quickly, may have said to them still one more time, the situation isn't quite as grave as it was uh, turning into. And back now a little bit ahead of the game here, but one of the elements that, brought, that Dodge uh, brought to the setting that is unequivocally what we like to see in all of us is a remarkable coolness under fire, if you'll pardon the expression there. Because as he does see the spot fires, he's got his crew reversed, they're coming back up. The end's in sight. He says to himself, by way of testimony, I've got 35, 30 to 45 seconds to go. 
And then, as Larry pointed out, he just sort of he hit on this tactic that had been pretty much undeveloped, unnamed, unused. So here's a guy when everybody else is uh, looking to be on the verge of panic, is not panicking. He's he's focused, still trying to solve problems. And so it's a, it's a it's, I suppose that's a learned skill, a kind of a mindset that we'd all like to see in ourselves when the pressure is really on. I'm not certain how I would have done myself here under the same circumstances. I'm sure not nearly as well, but it's good in principle to help ourselves and people who work with us when the pressure is really on to keep thinking, not turn that CPU off, to focus on the problem and not run. Just as you have had to invest time and effort to become an effective firefighter, you must also spend time and effort to become an effective leader. And just as the business, military, and fire leaders you've seen are investing their time to learn from an historical event, you too should seek opportunities that enable you to become a student of leadership. In this scenario, we'll examine character and how it communicates a leader's values. Just minutes before marching his regiment into the pivotal Battle of Gettysburg, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain is given responsibility for 120 mutineers from his home state of Maine. Consider Colonel Chamberlain's actions and how they demonstrate his values. darling. Rise up, me bucko. Oh, I'm sorry, darling, but we got a bit of a problem here, Colonel. Would you like to hear about it? Would you wake up, sir? We got a whole company coming, sir. This way. I'll give you time to wake up, but we've got quite a problem. Altogether, uh, 120 men are coming. We're to be having them as guests. What? Yeah, should be here any minute. Who? Mutineers. Mutineers, Colonel, my lad. 120 men from the old second main, which has been disbanded. 100, <clears throat> 120 mutineers. Yes, sir. Wow. You see, what happened was that the enlistment papers on the old second main ran out. So they were sent home, all except these 120 fellows who'd foolishly signed three-year papers. Three years, that is. So these poor fellows, they got one more year to serve. Only, you see, they thought they were signing to fight only with the second main, and the second main only. So they, uh, quit. They resigned, you see. 120 men. <laughs> Colonel, are you all right? No. Well, the point is, sir, these main fellas, they won't fight no more. And nobody can send them home, and nobody knows what to do with them. Till they thought of us, being as we are the only other main regiment in the 5th Corps. So they've been assigned to us. Yes, sir. I have a message here from the new commanding general. George Meade, sir, that's right. Our very own general of our very own corps has been promoted to command of the whole army. Uh, the latest, if you keep track of them as they go by. Well, the message says uh, they'll be arriving this morning and they're to join us. Oh, and if they refuse to follow orders, please feel free to shoot them. To shoot them? Yes, sir. Well, these are the main men. <clears throat> you, are, you are hereby authorized to shoot any man who refuses to do his duty. Master, are, th are these all main men? Yes, sir. And fine big fellas they are, too. <sighs> Mutiny. I thought that was a word for the Navy. <laughs> We'll move at sunrise. It's a good time of day. I always do enjoy this time just before the dawn. 
When all this is over, I shall miss it very much. Sir? I didn't mean to fight it. Oh. Well, all in God's hands now. Good day, sir. Good day, John. Sir? Gonna wake him up, sir? Gonna get him waked up and get going? No, oh, Moxley. Let the boys sleep a little longer. They're gonna need it. Yes, sir. The, uh, Somewhere around 250, sir. We're counting the officers. How the heck are we supposed to take care of 120 men? Colonel, it's going to be a hot day today. Seeing that you've already been down with the heat, please, will you ride the horse, Colonel, that the good Lord provided instead of marching around in the hot, damn, dirty dust? Well, you walked. Colonel, darling, I've been in the infantry since you was in books. It's the first few thousand miles after that a man gets limber with his feet. Good morning, Lawrence. How are you? You're looking kind of peaky. Darn it, Tom, don't call me Lawrence. It doesn't make sense. Hold a gun on a man to get in a fight. Detail! About face! Attention, detail! You heard the captain. Handle attention. Guards, get these men back on their feet. I'm looking for commanding officer, 20th Maine. You found him. That's him, all right. You Chamberlain? Colonel Chamberlain to you. Captain Brewer, sir. 118th Pennsylvania. If you're the commanding officer, sir, then I present you with these prisoners here. And you're welcome to them. Lord knows. Had to use the bayonet to keep them moving. You have to sign for them. Sign it, Lieutenant. You are relieved, Captain. You're authorized to use whatever force necessary, Colonel. You want to shoot him? You go right ahead. Won't nobody say nothing. I said you are relieved, Captain. You men can leave now. We won't be needing any guards. My name is Chamberlain. I'm the Colonel of the 20th Maine. What did you fellas eat last? When did you have something to eat? They're trying to break us by not feeding us. We ain't broke yet. They just told me you were coming a little while ago. So, uh, I'll get the cook going. Meat may be a little raw, but there's not much time to cook. We've got quite a ways to go today. You'll be coming with us, so eat hearty. We'll set you up over in those trees there. Sergeant Toja, see to it. Yes, sir. Well, you boys go eat, and then I'll come over and hear what you have to say. Colonel. Colonel, we got grievances. The men elected me to talk for him. Yes, all right. You come along with me. The rest of you boys go eat. We're going to get moving in a little bit. All right, men. 
On your feet. Gosh, Lawrence. Smile. Don't call me Lawrence. Left, Are right. they moving? Yes, sir. Forward. Ah. What's your name? I don't feel too kindly, Colonel. Yes, well, I'm usually not this informal. <clears throat> I just, uh... Oh, I just took command of this regiment a few days ago, so somebody ought to welcome you to my, uh, to uh, our outfit. They, uh, they tell me that uh, they're holding you fellas because you signed three-year papers. Is, I'm sorry. Would you like some coffee? You sure? Uh, go ahead. Why don't you sit down, Mr. Uh... Buckland. Buckland. Joseph Buckland. Mm -hmm. Listen, Colonel. I have been in 11 different engagements. How many have you been in? Not that many. It ain't the papers. I've done my share. We all have. The damn good men. Should not to be used this way. Look you here. Went clean through. Colonel, we got a courier coming. Listen, Colonel. I'm tired. You know what I mean? I'm tired. I've had all this army and all these officers, this damn hooker and this damn idiot Meade, all of them. The whole bloody, lousy, rotten mess of sick brain, pot bellied scared heads that ain't fit to lead a Johnny detail. They, they ain't fit to, to pour pee out of a boot with instructions written under the heel. I'm tired. We are good men and we had our own good flag. And these damn idiots use us like we were cows or dogs or, or worse. We ain't gonna win this war. We can't win know-how with these lame-brained bastards from West Point. These, these damn gentlemen, these officers. The courier, sir. Don't go away. Colonel Chamberlain, sir. Colonel Vincent wishes to inform you that the 5th Corps is moving out at once. And you, sir, with the 20th Maine Regiment are instructed to take the lead. The 20th Maine has been assigned the first position in line. You will send out advance guards and flankers, sir. Flankers? Yes, flankers. Right. Yes, my compliments to the colonel. Captain Clark, you heard him. Get the regiment up, sound the assembly, strike the tents. You, uh, you better get yourself something to eat. Looks like you could use it, all right? Tell your men I'm coming. The boys from the 2nd Maine are being fed, Lawrence. Yep. Don't call me Lawrence. Don't you, Lawrence, I'm your brother. Well, just be careful about the name business in front of the men, all right? Just because you're my brother, it looks like favoritism. God almighty, General Meade's got his own son as his aide-de-camp. Well, that's different. Generals can do anything. It's nothing quite so much like God on Earth as a general on a battlefield, so... Well, what are you gonna do with him, huh, sir? Colonel, sir. You can't shoot him. You never go back to Maine, you do that. I know that. I know that. I wonder if they do. Colonel, sir, hmm. you know who the stuck in Maine that is? Dan Burns from Orno. I know his daddy, the preacher. Best darn cussing I've ever heard. Hmm. Knows more fine swear words than any man in Maine. Gather round. I've been talking with uh, Private Buckland. He's told me about your problem. There's nothing I can do today. We're moving out in a few minutes. We'll be moving all day. I've been ordered to take you men with me. I'm told that... Uh, that if you don't come, I can shoot you. Well, you know I won't do that. Maybe somebody else will, but I won't. So, that's that. Uh, here's the uh, situation. The whole Reb Army is up that road a ways waiting for us, so this is no time for an argument like this, I tell you. We could surely use you fellas. We're now well below half strength. Whether you fight or not, that's, that's up to you. Whether you come along is is, well, you're coming. You know who we are, what we're doing here, but if you're gonna fight alongside us, there's a few things I want you to know. 
This regiment was formed last summer in Maine. There were a thousand of us then. There are less than 300 of us now. All of us volunteered to fight for the Union, just as you did. Some came mainly because we were bored at home, thought this looked like it might be fun. Some came because we were ashamed not to. Many of us came because it was the right thing to do. And all of us have seen men die. This is a different kind of army. If you look back through history, you will see men fighting for pay, for women, for some other kind of loot. They fight for land, power, because a king leads them or, or just because they like killing. But we are here for something new. This has not happened much in the history of the world. We are an army out to set other men free. America should be free ground, all of it, not divided by a line between slave state and free, all the way from here to the Pacific Ocean. No man has to bow. No man born to royalty. Here we judge you by what you do, not by who your father was. Here you can be something. Here is the place to build a home. But it's not the land. There's always more land. It's the idea that we all have value. You and me. What we're fighting for, in the end, fighting for each other. Sorry, I uh, didn't mean to preach. <clears throat> you, uh, you go ahead, you talk for a while. Uh, if you, uh, if you choose to join us, you want your muskets back, you can have them. Nothing more will be said by anybody anywhere. If you uh, choose not to join us, well, you can come along under guard, and when this is all over, I will do what I can to see you get a fair treatment, but for now, we're moving out. Gentlemen, I think if we lose this fight, we lose the war. So if you choose to join us, I'll be personally very grateful. Sir, it's a fine morning. Captain Spear, are we ready? Sir, that we are. Well, then let's move out. 20th Maine! Forward! 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 March! Colonel, do you mind? Oh, 
Good officer doesn't ride all day up to sit. Hey, Lars. Anyway. What do you think? God almighty. What do you think? About what? About the second main boys. What else? Oh, are, there, are any of them going to join us? Would you believe it? All but six. What? I counted by actual vote. 114 of them voted to pick up the rifle. Well, I'll be. You did good, brother. You did real good. Good, good. Let's see to it they march together, all right? Yes, sir. Glad you got the hotheads in tow, sir. Fine. There were six of them. Fine. Get their names, put them in different companies. I want them spread out. I don't want them bunched together, all right? Yes, sir. I'll see about their muskets. Colonel. Sir. we'll see examples of three basic leadership styles. A high school football team is caught in the racial strife from integration of public schools by busing during the early 1970s. Consider the various techniques used by the coach to lead his staff and team through a field of obstacles toward a common goal. In this first example, the coach uses a directing leadership style to address a problem that needs immediate attention. Listen up, I don't care if you're black, green, blue, white, or orange. I want all of my defensive players on this side, all players going out for offense over here, right now. Let's move, let's move, let's move, let's move. You and you, offensive bus, sit together. You and you, defensive bus, sit together. Get comfortable, too, because the person that I have you sitting next to is the same one that you'll be rooming with for the duration of this camp. In this second example, the coach relies on a delegating leadership style when dealing with a key team member. Can I speak with you in private? Sure. What's on your mind, sir? I want Ray off the team, coach. You know my policy, Gary. Yes, I do. And I respect it, but I know that Ray missed that block on purpose. Sometimes you just got to cut a man loose. Hmm. Well, you're the captain. You make a decision, but you support your decision. Ray? You're out. What? I'm not going to let you play for this team anymore. Oh, yeah, Jerry Lewis. Gonna go and tell Coach Kuhn what to do, just like last time? But then that's right. He is your daddy now, isn't he? Kuhn don't cut anybody. Remember, Gary? I had you cut, Ray. You willing to just throw away our friendship for them? You can keep on. In this third example, the coaches demonstrate a participating leadership style by sharing responsibility on several levels within the team during a critical situation. We're in a fight. You boys are doing all that you can do. Anybody can see that. Win or lose, we're going to walk out of this stadium tonight with our heads held high. Do your best. That's all anybody can ask for. No, it ain't, Coach. In all due respect, uh, you demanded more of us. You demanded perfection. Now, I ain't saying that I'm perfect, because I'm not. And I ain't going to never be. None of us are. But we have won every single game we have played till now. So this team is perfect. We stepped out on that field that way tonight. And, uh, if it's all the same to you, Coach Boone, that's how we want to leave it. Yeah. I hope you boys have learned as much from me this year as I've learned from you. You've taught this city how to trust the soul of a man rather than the look of him. And I guess it's about time I joined the club. Herman, I sure could use your help. Ed Henry's kicking my ass out. Throughout your personal and professional life, you'll encounter a variety of ethical dilemmas. In this interview with Tom Boatner, 
retired chief of fire operations for the Bureau of Land Management, will examine an ethical dilemma he faced as a smoke jumper squad leader early in his career. When I was a, a new smoke jumper squad leader, I traveled with a group of smoke jumpers from my base to another base in response to a fairly large uh, fire bust that was going on. It turned out to be a bust that lasted for a couple weeks and it was a fire bust of historic proportions at that time. Eventually I ended up on a, a 10 to 12,000 acre fire with 16 jumpers. Um, other than us, the fire was unstaffed. The jumpers came from bases around the country and included three or four jumpers from my base that as a squad leader I was responsible for. And we were working for a very experienced senior smoke jumper leader from the base that we were operating out of. He was the jumper in charge in the IC until we were replaced. The fire was about 10 to 12,000 acres and our mission was to anchor in and flank and secure as much perimeter as we could until we were replaced within a day or two by a type two team and a group of fire resources that they would bring. So we jumped the fire uh, in the late afternoon and be st established an anchor point and began working up the left flank. And we were working for a senior smoke jumper and a squad leader from the uh, base that we were operating out of, he was in charge. So um, as the, that first evening went on, a little tension developed over a small group of us up at the front working pretty hard and driving on and this uh, senior jumper, the guy who was in charge at the back with the rest of the crew, he just didn't seem to really want to work that hard. He seemed to be focusing on not working. And I remember being puzzled by that because I thought, you know, we got a great opportunity here to contain an impressive amount of line. And when whoever replaces us shows up, um, we can have left this great impression that 16 smoke jumpers can knock off an amazing amount of work. So I was not happy that this tension was there. Uh, ultimately, we worked that night till one or two in the morning and then slept in the dirt for a couple hours to get a little break. It was cold, we didn't have any gear with us and we got a little bit of rest, but it wasn't very high quality. Next day, again, we worked at securing perimeter all day long um, and that, again, that tension existed all day long between um, working hard and driving forward and hanging back and taking it easy. And um, I remember being upset that we weren't more focused on getting the work done and driving on. Second evening, uh, a light helicopter came out to bump some food and water up to us from our jump spot because we were almost out. And I listened for the jumper in charge to uh, um, ask him to bring up our sleeping bags so we could get a little bit more high quality rest that second night. He didn't ask and I called him on the radio and asked him, are you gonna have the helicopter bump our sleeping bags up? And I remember hearing that he was not happy with me for bringing it up because I don't really think he intended to ask for our sleeping bags. I think he intended to sleep in the dirt again. Anyways, we got the sleeping bags, got four or five hours of decent sleep and uh, worked through about the middle of the next day when we were relieved by this incoming Type 2 team and other resources and we traveled back to the base that we're operating out of. At that point, he gave us a timesheet for the work we had done and I was pretty amazed and fairly angry to get a timesheet that showed us working 48 hours straight from the minute we jumped the fire to the minute we arrived back at the jump base. And I really felt like a couple of our core values were um, in, in question. We have a duty, I believe, to work as hard as we can. And we have a duty to be honest in the way we log the time we work. I didn't believe he'd done either. He hadn't worked hard enough and he'd been dishonest in the way he logged his time. So my first ethical quandary was what do I do with this dishonest timesheet? I got the guys that I was responsible for from my base together and told them I, I can't turn in this timesheet it's dishonest. And they were all hanging their heads and scuffing the toes of their boots and nodding their head because they knew I think they knew that what I was saying was right. And we, we quickly agreed that we would adjust the timesheet to um, represent 
an honest reflection of the work and the breaks we'd taken, and that's what we would turn in. The, the second part of my dilemma then ethically was what do I do about addressing what I consider this jumper in charge, his failure to adhere to our agreed upon values of work ethic and integrity and our duty to meet those values. And I was very torn by that. Um, it was a very busy period operationally. Um, there were jumpers from all over the country there. I was afraid of being branded as a rat fink or a tattletale, and I was afraid that um, I would open a can of worms that would be pretty unpleasant and pretty, un pretty ugly. And ultimately, I chickened out, and I didn't, um, I didn't confront this jumper, and I didn't go to the base manager with my concerns. And when I look back many years later on this ethical dilemma, I am happy that I had the courage to address my, um, the guys from my base that I was responsible for and not turning in a dishonest timesheet, but I am disappointed that I didn't have the courage to finish the job and confront this guy and his base manager about his lack of integrity and his poor work ethic. Throughout your personal and professional life, you'll encounter a variety of ethical dilemmas. In this interview with Tom Taylor, a district fire crew leader with the U.S. Forest Service, we'll examine an ethical dilemma he faced as a new squad boss early in his career. I was the squad boss on a 20-person hand crew that consisted of people from three different ranger districts. We were dispatched to a fire in the North Cascades of Washington State. Upon arriving at that fire, we were told we were going to a different fire up the road that was basically a mop-up show. So right off the bat, we were kind of bummed that we were leaving the big show to head to this mop-up show. And when we get to the fire, it's located in a steep, narrow canyon with the main fire that was pretty much out between the main road and a river. To the east of that river was some smaller spot fires that needed to be mopped up. So we had a 20-person crew, two Mark III pumps, and about 2,500 feet of hose. The crew was split up into three squads, and my squad had six people on it, one of which I had worked one season with before, and then five rookies, fresh from guard school from different ranger districts. And so I'd never met any of these folks before. Our objective was to anchor into the hand line, dig line around the fire, and tie in with the other squad that was going around the other side. So immediately upon uh, engagement, the fire activity increased, and so we started spraying water on it. We disengaged. And over the course of our engagement, we broke two tools, blew several, several chunks of hose, and basically abandoned the pump operation. So we went from a mop-up fire, kind of being bummed out, to being all pumped up because we actually had fire and we're digging hotline, to tools breaking and hoses blowing. And as an inexperienced squad boss, I was starting to feel overwhelmed, kind of beyond my means, you know, dealing with, with things that I'd never really had to deal with before, broken tools, blown hose, inexperienced crew members increased fire behavior. Uh, we had another squad show up and I was very relieved to see them because I could kind of ditch my squad off on them and hide in the back, maybe patrol the line and watch and learn how the squad boss handles these situations. So A, I can learn from this and B, I can not have that stress level on my shoulders. Well, the crew boss trainee ordered that squad to go around to the other side of the fire and start building fire line over there. So here I am kind of deflated again, being not really forced back into the squad leader position, but, but having to, to uh, learn in an environment that I'm, I'm not used to working in. And about that time, we had a flare up that separated the SAW team from us and I was a little nervous about that because their egress had, had been uh, cut off and they were unable to get to the escape route. So when the fire 
the flare-up died down a little bit. <clears throat> I was able to go and grab them, bring them back with the squad. And at that time, a combination of fatigue, my lack of experience, and kind of being overwhelmed, I felt that we should disengage our side of the fire. So I called the crew boss trainee, and he came over, and we had a discussion. And he informed me that if we could hook this fire and start flanking it, that we'd be able to tie the hand line into the river. And he said we could do this if I took the saw and he watched my squad. And here I am, I'm pumped up again, I'm totally stoked. It's like, all right, I don't have to watch my squad anymore. I can just be a Sawyer, which is what I know. So I gladly accepted the assignment, started cutting saw line. I ran out of fuel, went to fuel up. I noticed that the crew boss trainee was gone and I was missing two squad members. So here I am, kind of deflated again. I hunt down the two, two crew members that were actually putting out a spot fire. And once they secured the spot fire, we got the squad back together, and I had no choice but to be a squad boss and a sawyer. So I continued with the saw line till I got to the river. Then I grabbed my Pulaski, went back to the crew, and we continued with the hand line and we had to uh, turn away from the main fire and go <clears throat> indirect due to the fire behavior. And we made it to the river and everything was good and we high-fived and I walked the hand line back to the anchor point, walked back to the river, and at that time we had about 100 spots over our line and the main fire had burned across the portion that we had gone indirect on. And I called the crew boss trainee, let him know of our situation and told him that we were gonna disengage and hike across the river and we would meet him on the road. The whole, the whole theme of the fire was aggressive firefighting tactics. Basically we were doing a frontal attack with single digit RHs and temperatures in the 90s. And we just kept doing a frontal attack, being aggressive. The hand line that I installed was actually indirect and so everybody knows or but I didn't know at the time that the fire would make a run under line and walk right across it. So we disengaged and we were eating, uh, basically hanging out and sharpening tools and, and eating lunch and whatnot. And that aggressive theme carried on into me receiving a radio call that said, get in the van and, and head up the road and, and tie in with me. And that was a call from the, the IC. <clears throat> so here we are being aggressive again. We hop in the van, we drive up the road, and basically the outcome of that was is there were a few people that were no longer able to fight fire aggressively anymore because they were burned over and, and uh, passed away. And through that whole day, we were just being aggressive, and we weren't being intelligent. We weren't being intelligent when we re-engaged without a briefing or establishing LC, E, and S. And that aggressiveness came back and bit us in the butt. And we got to a site where we felt safe and we had a chance to maybe prep that a little bit. And, and uh, that went by the wayside. So we just basically succumbed to hanging out and waiting and the fire allows us to do certain things and on that particular day the fire didn't allow us to be aggressive and it didn't allow us to be reactive once we were in a situation where we were at a, a point where we had to deploy. Personal and professional life, you'll encounter a variety of ethical dilemmas. In this interview with Crew Ramsey and Engine Captain with the U.S. Forest Service, we'll examine ethical dilemmas she faced as a trainee squad boss early in her career. So, a few years ago, I was working for Yosemite National Park and I had gotten a new task book. I was going to be a Firefighter One trainee and nice big task book, nothing was written in it. And we finally got an assignment and it was going to be a Type 2 crew, a bunch of people coming together from all these parks, and we met up at the Mobilization Center. And the first person I meet was the crew boss and cool, confident, ex-hotshot, um, just had the, the security that I needed as a trainee. 
Next guy I meet is the crew boss trainee. And for me, he was the exact opposite. He just seemed nervous. He seemed a little insecure. And I just didn't get that, that security that I needed from him. So we got the bus loaded up, got ready to go, and still didn't have an assignment. Rumor was, if we didn't get an assignment, by the end of the day, we would be disbanded. Everybody would go home. And I was totally bummed because I really wanted something in this task book, you know. So finally, we get an assignment, and we're going to northern Nevada, out to, or, towards Elko. And I'd never been there, but the crew boss seemed happy, so I was happy. So we load up the bus, we start driving all night. We realized that there was too many people for the bus. So the crew boss trainee and a crew member would ride in a rental car right behind the bus. Well, the first gas stop, we got split up. We went one way, they went the other. And phone calls, radio calls, back and forth, can't find each other. Just figured that, hey, we're all going to end up in the same spot. Let's just keep going. So we get to this meadow where everybody's going to be there. And we are the first ones there. We beat everybody there. So they made chow real fast, powdered eggs, standing up, you know, uh, frozen ham for lunch in our packs. But we got an assignment. Crew boss trainee shows up. And that's the first time I saw the crew boss and the crew boss trainee argue. And they argue, you left me, you know, all this stuff. No, I didn't. I tried to call you back and forth, back and forth. And then they decided, hey, you know, we got an assignment. Let's just move on. So got an assignment to go out to this fire. And we're trying to find the right road. We finally find what we think is the right road. We head up. And pretty soon it gets really bumpy. And the, we're in a school bus. And the bus driver says, all right, that's it. You know, can't go anymore. The bus just isn't made for this. So crew boss jumps out. And we were in like a gully and low terrain. So we couldn't really see the column. And we could see smoke. We can see. We couldn't tell where it was. So he jumps out and heads up over the little rise. And we're waiting and waiting. And pretty soon, people are calling him. He's not calling back. We don't know where he is. Is he in danger? The column's getting bigger, more smoke. Definitely getting a little bit closer. And the panic starts. The crew's starting to get nervous. We're looking at the crew boss trainee. He is not really making any decisions. People are like, OK, you know, you can feel that nervous energy. Everybody's, you know, column's getting bigger. Where is he? What do we do? Nobody's making decisions. There's like a cluster around the trainee, you know, make a decision. And people are starting to grab fusees. Like, you know, they got strikers out. There's like a mutiny going on. And so he's not, he's not helping out. He's not being a leader at the moment. So I went and sat down on the bus. Man, the crew boss will be back. I won't have to deal with what's going on outside. He'll be back. A couple minutes later, he's still not back. Can't find him on the radio. So I get off the bus. I have a duty, I have a responsibility as a trainee. I got my people to lead, and here I am sitting on the bus. So I get off the bus. And I'm watching the crew boss and, and the trainee, and he's still not making decisions, and people are starting to do their own thing. And I'm watching him, and still no decision. So I get back on the bus, and I physically sit down again. And I was like, well, I don't like that out here. Well, maybe I'll just sit down for a while. Well, that's not helping either because I still, you know, I still have this duty, but I have, still have this loyalty to the crew boss who still isn't back. So then I get off the bus and finally I'm committed. All right, what do you want? Make a decision. This is what we're going to do. And he's still not making a decision, but then over the radio we hear that we found the crew boss. Crew boss is, he's fine. He's walking back towards the bus. People are starting to put, you know, hide the fusees, you know, and um, so he comes back over and Crew boss comes up, crew boss trainee, they start arguing. You left me, you abandoned us, you left the bus, and the word abandon came up. I didn't abandon you guys, I wouldn't do that to you, I was being a, you know, a lookout, I wouldn't do that to you guys. And then they realize the whole crew is staring at them as they're arguing with each other. So then they try to go around the bus. Well, we can still hear them arguing and yelling and everything. So then crew boss comes back and it was like I apologize to you guys I did not abandon you I wouldn't do that this is what I was trying to do I'm sorry I didn't portray that to you guys and tell you what I was doing this is what happened but you could feel the physical split I mean half the crew really thought that we had gotten abandoned and were scared and angry about that and the other half was like no the crew boss is doing what he needed to do acting as a lookout finding out where the fire was so there was a definite split and it didn't ever get mended, it never got resolved. Um, the crew boss came back and apologized, I didn't abandon you guys, but it, it, it was done. The crew had been split. Um, I never had to make that choice of my loyalty to the crew boss who I liked and the crew boss trainee who I didn't trust his decisions. 
And I never had to make that decision. But I think it was just a precursor, just a catalyst for the events that would happen. My dilemma got solved pretty much all by itself because I never had to make that decision. I never had to choose the crew boss or the crew boss trainee. I was literally saved by the bell and he came back in time where the decision was made. The crew, the, the gap in the crew though never got resolved. That dilemma of the split got even maybe even bigger over the next couple of days. Um, to the point that the crew boss and the crew boss tra trainee never mended their relationship and it never mended the crew. And so it was easier for the crew boss trainee to take logistical assignments and to not be necessarily in the picture. And the crew boss took over the crew. And over the next couple of days, we took an assignment on the Sadler fire. And the, I was part of the burn squad that was chosen by the crew boss. I was on that side of the bus, per se. And I was definitely on that side where I agreed with him. And so I was chosen for that burning assignment. And out of that, the four of us that were originally chosen as the burn squad, and then the two that were added on later, um, all six of us had smoke inhalation of, of some point from the burnover. And two out of the six of us ended up in Elko Hospital with second degree burns. you'll encounter a variety of ethical dilemmas. In this interview with Bill Middleton, retired assistant chief for the San Diego Fire Rescue Department, will examine an ethical dilemma he faced toward the end of his career. I uh, retired from the San Diego Fire Department about a year ago and my last position was assistant chief. And so I had things that I had to deal with come across my desk pretty regular. Um, this one I'm going to tell you about now is, is one that uh, uh, came at the end of my career and uh, it was pretty challenging. It, uh, it was a uh, issue that concerned the activity surrounding an engine company responding to an incident. This engine company came to work and they had a captain and an engineer and the engineer was on the captain's list. He anticipated a promotion in the next several months and so they had arranged for him to take advantage of an opportunity to get some acting captain time. So they swapped positions. The captain drove the fire engine. Engineer was the acting captain. Early on in their shift, they picked up an incident. It was a medical aid. And it came in as a report of a 23-year-old female in cardiac arrest. As the crew was getting ready to respond to the incident, they got on board the rig. And they pulled out. And they noticed smoke off in the distance. And it appeared to be a structure fire. It happened to be along the route of response that they were going to take to the medical aid incident. They had a discussion, the captain and the acting captain had a discussion along the way that they would drive as close as they could without deviating and take a look at it and radio in to fire communications, tell them what the fire looked like, make a recommendation of what they needed to send over there and continue on to the medical emergency. As they got closer to the smoke, they saw that it was in fact a structure fire and they got about a block away and they saw quite a few people standing on the corner waving a man aggressively you know and it was uh, pretty apparent that that the folks thought they had a, a significant problem there and they thought that help was on the way the driver the captain couldn't see the fire real well but the acting captain could and he believed he saw a working fire on the second floor of an apartment house he picked up the mic and he radioed fire communications and told him that and he added that he believed that there was a imminent need for rescue and that he was going to divert from the medical emergency over to the structure fire and asked fire communications to assign a second engine to work with the ambulance on the medical emergency. They responded over to the fire, didn't quite turn out to be what they thought it was going to be. It was a building adjacent to the apartment building. It was well involved in fire, but it was pretty much contained to the exterior of the apartment. So they didn't have a big, a, a bigger problem as they thought they did. 
about the time they, they got there, the battalion chief arrived and he was the supervisor of the first alarm assignment. He came up and, and spoke to the captain, said, hey, I heard you on the radio. He said, uh, I'm not sure this was the best decision. I'm kind of curious why you didn't continue on your response to that medical emergency. And the captain acknowledged that in hindsight that probably would have been the better thing to do. Um, but there was a lot of factors there. And so the battalion chief said, well, we're going to have to obviously discuss this some more. He went to his boss, shift commander, deputy chief, had a discussion. They decided that the, it, the situation required a fact finding. Uh, they bounced it off of the director of operations who worked down the hall from me and he agreed. And so they in fact did put together a fact finding and a couple of weeks later, that fact, the results of that fact finding ended up at, at my, my, on my desk. Real comprehensive job, told the whole story. And it looked like there might have been an issue there that, uh, that didn't suggest good decision making. Struggle with a few conflicting values. The first, that we have a commitment to the public. We have a commitment to the citizens to deliver that prompt response when we say we're going to. And we're going to be out there to, to solve their problem. Also had a issue that was specific to the organization itself. We, we have a a concern and, and a priority on adherence to our standards. It's, it's the backbone of our integrity. It's, it's, the, it's the expectation that the organization works with predictability and, and with consistency and does the right thing. And then ultimately, if, if I needed to do anything directly to these two individuals in, in addressing this situation, I wanted to make sure that the organization was fair to them, gave them an honest look, because we charged them with making critical decisions in a very short time frame. I didn't want the outcome from that to be one that would sug suggest that management is looking to second guess these decisions, and at the same time make sure that all of those captains out there understood that there's a high expectation for good decision making. After a real careful review of the fact-finding results and a lot of consideration of all of those values. I basically arrived that there was, a, there was an error made here. The question that I had in front of me now was how to deal with that error. On the San Diego Fire Department, probably like most organizations, we, we had an application of a variety of different forms of dif discipline, everything from, from something equivalent of, to a slap on the wrist to termination. And along the way, those different levels of discipline can have some remarkably long-lasting effect on an individual's career. These were two good people. In fact, I was impressed with their ownership of their responsibility in this whole situation. They were accountable. They didn't shy away from it. They owned every bit of it. It was a true reflection, I thought, of their values. At the same time, I think they made an error. What we arrived at was writing them a reprimand, which was just short of a level of discipline that would have affected their careers, would have affected promotions, would have affected an awful lot of their future. And these were two good people. I didn't want to see that happen. In addition to that, we, we played the tape of the mother who called in that run and asked them to listen to it. There's a detachment out on that engine company from that contact with the people that call for that help, needed them to hear that. And then we had a long conversation about ethics, about decision making, about trying to establish priorities. And in this particular case, making sure that when you deviate from a, a department policy, a department standard, that you've got a very strong defensible priority saying that that was the right thing to do. I've looked back on that decision that I made to deal with this circumstance quite a few times. And every time I feel comfortable that it was handled appropriately. I think we had a responsibility to the citizens to make sure that if we identified an error made that it's dealt with, and we did. I think that we chose a course of action that made sure that the two individuals involved understood the error that was made, 
and the responsibility they have for accountability to their actions and, and to the outcomes of what it is that they're responsible for. And I also believe that the message reaffirmed to the other members of the organization that we weren't simply looking for problems and that when we found problems, we didn't feel it necessary to, to rewrite our standards and policies. We just had to take a look at the individual issue and determine if there was a right or wrong. And if there was a wrong, we, we worked to correct it and not undermine the expectation for that good performance out there and for that expectation of accountability. Long day, huh? All right, folks, let's go ahead and get started on the after action review for the uh, Horse Creek burn. Uh, we had a pretty good day out there. Uh, the purpose of this after action review is, is to uh, focus on, on the what, not the who. Okay, we want to learn from today's burn and apply as much of that knowledge as possible into the next burns. We all know this was a, a big deal interagency set up, sat on the shelf for two years. There was a lot of pressure to get this done, and we're going to be doing more of this. Okay, we're probably doing a lot of these burns in the future. So what I'd like to do is capture as much uh, knowledge and uh, learn from our, our mistakes and learn from our positives today and, uh, and wrap that up into the burn package. The, the ground rules uh, are very simple for the after action review. Uh, let's not make it personal, let's keep it professional. Uh, and please don't interrupt each other, let folks say their piece, get their comments out, but do try to keep your comments short so we can get out of here before it gets too much later. And then the final thing is what's said here stays here. And there's a caveat attached to that. Uh, what I need to do is, is to capture as much information in writing so we can put it into the packaging. And Pete, you could take notes for us. Sure, we have to. And, and the way we want to take the notes is, uh, I'll give you an example. If, if we decided that uh, through this after action review that lathe didn't fill up the drip torches and that led to a delay getting ignition started, we wouldn't say that. We would say, uh, make sure drip torches have filled up the night before to avoid delays in the morning. So we don't attach names. It's not about blame. Uh, I'm sure as we go through this, all of us are going to you know, focus on things we could have done different. Or, so let's just keep the names out of it. And uh, let's make sure we capture the important points. And we'll get it wrapped up. OK, uh, is everybody good to go? We get started? I'm going to go off the uh, IRPG, the simple four question format, uh, after action review, page 17. And uh, let's start with the first question. What was the overall objective of the burn? Well, the uh, objective, uh, it was a fuels reduction burn. We were looking to reduce uh, hopefully 75% of, uh, of the fuel loading in the area with as, met, as minimal damage as we could to the, uh, uh, the mature trees in the area. Um, those were our, our primary objectives. Uh, as far as what was planned, the, uh, as you mentioned, the Horse Creek burn, we've kind of had it sit on the shelf for a while. Uh, a lot of time effort went into the planning, uh, the, the writing of the burn plan. Uh, but busy season, we were kind of slow out of the chute to get things going. Uh, didn't have quite enough talent on the district or qualifications, so brought some new folks in to help us out. And, okay. Uh, that was the plan. All right, real good. Uh, let's let's focus on uh, on the planning part. The first question: What was the uh, what was the ignition pattern, Chris? Uh, you were the ignition specialist out there today. Uh, what was your plan for firing the unit? Well, the plan was Curtis to start up in the northeast corner uh, with two ignition teams. One larger than the other with Curtis or with uh, Travis excuse me holding for us to, to light a test fire and if that went well to proceed and tie it down into Horse Creek and then also to take fire south along the ridge. Okay what was the plan for holding? Travis you were the holding specialist out there what was what were you foreseeing? That was pretty straightforward um, keep it in the unit you know I'm holding this ridge and this is the hand line so I focused a lot on that. I wasn't as concerned with the, um, the drainage, but you know, I had a hand crew up there and we had engines at the road and pretty straightforward holding show. Okay. 
Uh, let's move on to what actually happened. We started burning, I believe it was about 9 o'clock we started ignition. Uh, Chris, why don't you fill us in on that? Yeah, Curtis, it was, uh, let me pull it out. Yeah, about 9 o'clock, we had ignition, uh, lit the test fire. Test fire went well. Um, from that point, we got the go from you and fired back to the west along the north perimeter and then began taking fire as well down the south end. Okay, the two engine captains, uh, Scott, what, what did you think of the test fire as things progressed? I thought that uh, test fire uh, was going well. Uh, Chris uh, and Travis and I, we all worked together and we were in agreement that the test fire was in uh, meeting our objectives at the time of the test fire. Cool. Can you make sure you capture that piece sure. in the notes? Test fire looked good. Lath? Yeah, I, you know, I agree. It looked really well. I mean, uh, it was doing exactly what we wanted. So, I agree. Okay, so I think we're all in agreement that the uh, test fire was good. We got progressing up. Uh, Travis, you started firing up the ridge. Mark, what, uh, how'd things look from down there? And you're the local fire department Well, chief. you know, we came in pretty nervous with the residents all concerned because we're burning in their backyard. So with the smoke and everything, they were a little concerned, but I was pretty happy what I saw with the test burn and what was going on. So from my point of view, it was a good thing. All right, if I remember right, about 1100, things started to change. I just want to move ahead because it seemed like it was pretty much uneventful up until that point. Uh, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, folks, but I believe the burn pattern looked about like this. Does that look close? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so let's take it up to 11 o'clock. Uh, we got the fire into this point. Chris, you're running ignitions and you're at this point. What, what, uh, what's going on? Well, about 11 o'clock, uh... We, we got to about there, things were going really well. Uh, winds were in good shape, we had good fire behavior, but we got into an area that, that surprised us, that there wasn't, the, the prep hadn't been completed through there. Um, so the prep, the prep wasn't completed, we were still continuing to fire as conditions were still uh, pretty optimal as far as getting the, the objectives met. Um, and shortly thereafter, as we got a little bit of a wind shift and, and got a spot fire across the line. Okay, let's hold it up there. Now, Travis, you're holding. Yeah. And you're up there with Chris. Um, Chris was saying that he didn't feel the prep was the standard. Uh, what, what do you, how do you feel about that? Well, it's hard to say, but I agree with him because I'm the one that did the prep. Um, but, but he's right. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, done as well as it had been previous to that. You know, all the area before. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's true. Okay. We we can uh, touch on that a little more in question three. So every so everyone's in agreement that the the prep probably wasn't done or was not done to standards up on the ridge. Okay. Yeah, that was a big part of it, Curtis. The other part is you know it was probably my fault as much as anything. I didn't get out and scout it ahead of time. I knew most of the folks. We worked together when I brought the. <coughs> The, the module over of hot shots. Uh, Travis was the only one that hadn't worked. With, okay, so. and what, we'll address that as we go on. I just want to make sure that everybody's comfortable with that statement that there are some issues with the prep. Now, uh, uh, you were firing pretty aggressively. If I remember right, you covered that distance in a very short time. What, what were you thinking with that? Well, it, the conditions were going well and, and uh, probably got a little bit overzealous and, and, and tried to get her done a little faster than we really needed to. The first part was going well. We had covered quite a bit of country and the winds were real favorable. So we continued, uh, thought it may be just a short section of prep. And so we decided we'd continue to go for it. Okay. Well, let's, let's bump the timeline up. Somewhere just after 11, if I remember right, uh, Travis, somebody called in a wind shift. Is that correct, about 11 o'clock? Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, Scott, that was you. You were taking weather. I, w I was taking weather and about 11.15 or so, we started getting strong winds out of the west. So we got a wind shift just to wind visualize here. West. You yes. got more of a west component. And and you contacted everyone on the radio? I did, yes. Okay. And we was in communications with ignitions and holding. Okay, so then we got, uh, it's about 11.15, I think, is when we had the spot fire, right? And that took place just over the ridge right here. Travis, why don't you uh, 
Why don't you fill us in on what happened at that point? It was it was pretty amazing how quickly it happened. He called in the wind shift, and uh, right away we got a spot. And uh, as holding, I, I contacted Blaith and um, let him know the general area. And right away he knew where it was, and he knew the best, quickest way to get there. And he was on top of it and got there. And, I was trying to get down there with the holding forces, but he had, he pretty much had it wrapped up. Okay, Lace, so you took action on the spot. Why don't you go ahead and uh, show us what happened here on the table? All right. Kind of pretty familiar with this area and, and <clears throat> noticed the wind switch. I was kind of ready for it. Uh, we came right in here, and, uh, and and I had the Forest Service guys right off the bat start, start doing a little structure protection. I called Mark because he had the bigger engine uh, to come in. And, uh, and the other engine was, uh, was actually on the fire. When Mark got here, uh, he took over the, the structure and, and the other engine helped on the, on the fire. And uh, you know, the, the spot fire actually went better than I thought. I thought it was gonna blow out, but uh, everybody worked well together and we hammered it. And you know, even, even with the wind that uh, kind of pushed him towards the cabin. But uh, the propane was, a, was an issue right off the bat. But uh, everybody did really well and hammered it. And you knocked it down about an acre? Yeah, yeah uh, probably an acre. Now, Mark, you were out there. You brought your uh, structure engine from the, from the fire department. Uh, what was going through your head when you pulled up? Well, with the structure engine, you know, our guys have got the proper PPE for the structure. So we bunkered up, got around the house, deployed our hoses, and, you know, uh, we secured the propane tank. Uh, our guys are pretty good at with the hazmat stuff and the propane. So we did, felt there was no issue with the propane, but we had everything secure while the other two engines uh, did their thing out there in the uh, spot fire. So I thought, from our point of view, we worked really good, all three engines. Yeah, I appreciate you guys being there too. It made it a lot easier for us to, to do our thing knowing you're back there. I also thought the communication between the three engines was, was really good. They, I mean, the focus, uh, the structure was, the structure guys took care of the structure and, and we went out and took care of the wildland. So, I thought that communication between the three uh, engines was really good also. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, what I'd like to do is, if everybody's in agreement, can we just kind of go back to the burn, the spot's wrapped up, and th then we progress with the firing operation down the ridge and back to the creek. And uh, uh, is everybody okay with moving on to that on, actually, on, the, on the second question? And we'll come back and address some of these issues on number, the third question. So Chris, uh, you guys regrouped and you started going down the ridge? Yeah, once uh, once we got the spot under control, uh, we kind of transitioned back into those uh, initial roles of, of ignition and, and holding, and we continued to progress, progress down the ridge. Had to take the crew while they were working on the spot fire down below. We couldn't really access it, so took the, the hotshot crew and they continued to prep, finished up the prep um, on down to the, to the end, and then we had the ignition team go ahead and, and finish down on the ridge, and it went well from there. Okay, let's go ahead, if everybody's cool, we'll, we'll call that good, and, and let's jump into the why it happened, and, and the why part I'd like to focus on, on the spot fire. Real quick, Lath, you had mentioned that, you know, you weren't, you didn't seem like you were surprised with the spot, and, You've worked in this area a lot. Did anything you can add to this? Yeah, about every every day about that time. Well, it, it shifts there, and and uh, you know I've been on on the district for 15 years, so I, you know, like I said, it didn't surprise me. I was just hoping I'd be wrong. I wasn't. I sure wish you would have said something at the briefing. You could have <laughs> well, planned for it. You know, I kind of I, I should have. I was to be honest, a little butt hurt that I wasn't involved a little more you know, uh, with my experience. And so I, you know, I kind of, I should have said something. If I may interject on, on further of why this probably happened, um, it was probably, a, we mentioned a little bit about the pressure. I think there's a little pressure to get this thing done in a hurry. We're up against the end of the fiscal year. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's been a busy year fighting fire. Even though we had this thing on the shelf ready to go, we didn't spend a whole lot of time from a district's perspective getting it ready for you guys. We had to ask folks to come in and help. Um, I had Lath off doing other things at the time. We had Travis down to help us prep. Um, big learning lesson notes I'll put down for ourselves is uh, 
to treat every burn. Even though this was only 100 acres, I think we were pretty relaxed knowing you folks were here to help. We should have uh, stepped it up a notch and been a little bit more prepared for you. And we certainly could have scouted that line as well. And Mr. Gordon, as a district FMO, you know, in the roll-up, if we can get this type of stuff captured, that'll help us back at home too, because we're under the same pressure. Absolutely. Okay, I think we're, we've kind of slid into the, to the final question on, on what we can do next time. It was a good lead-in, Pete, with, uh, uh, sounds like for the most part, just slowing down, taking our time, getting together, talking about stuff. Uh, Lace, I think we, we kind of caught, uh, kind of wrapped up what we talked about. Get you, get you folks, you guys that have been around for a while, more involved in the, in the planning. Is there anything that you could have done different uh, on the day of the burn? You know, I should have spoke up and uh, I, I should have maybe even came out a little earlier and drove the line and, and you know, I could have said we need to, you know, fix that one area. And, and I, you know, I should have spoke up mainly. And it's just like with Mark, the positive is having you here, and, and the thing to learn from is to have you more involved. Yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, when there is a lot of overhead, I you get a little intimidated, don't want to say much. And, sure. and uh, you know, I felt like maybe you guys wouldn't listen to me, so I didn't, I didn't talk. Well, I tell you, after the day, I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> All right. Say the cabin. And I don't want to, don't want to uh, word this topic out, but I just want to make sure that we're in agreement that uh, for holding an ignition that we can all and everybody else that uh, we need to uh, take a look at our prep, uh, probably have better standards, more involvement. Does that sound good? Yeah. And then Chris, if we had to do the same burn again over tomorrow, uh, would, how would you do your ignition pattern? As far as ignition, probably a little bit slower. You know, one of the keys is getting folks out there and ensuring the prep's done. Maybe have a couple of folks is to, to clean it up as we go. But again, just take it a little bit slower and uh, be a little more mindful of, of what's happening with the wind and we got into the fuel, so. Now Scott, you've been pretty quiet today. Anything you want to add? Um, just something I was noticing uh, with operations, uh, when we did get the spot fire, uh, I think as uh, something that we could use as a collective group is uh, we could have discussed uh, trigger points uh, a little more uh, profoundly in the, in the briefing that if this does, if this something does happen on the lee side of the ridge there that that this is what's going to happen. We're going to stop ignition. Holding is going to hold. The engines are going to go over there, and, and we'll have that trigger point in place uh, that we can use next time. That's an excellent suggestion. Something else as far as the future. Uh, some of the contingency stuff was a little bit unclear in the briefing. And that was me. As, yeah, as burn boss, you know, I've got a 70-page burn plan in my pocket, and I think I talked, what, 15, 30 seconds about contingency, and uh, fortunately, you guys were here. So that's, that's a good one for me to take home. Chris, I think Keep in the future too, you know, the way you're asking each of us, you know, before the, in the briefing, you should have done that too, maybe, you know, said, Lath, how do you feel about this? And, and Mark, how do you, you know, it's kind of, you did your briefing and then we went and, and lit, so. Okay, so open it up, give a little more time for questions, that 20 yeah, second I, pause for questions in the morning. And, and I know we were in a rush to, you know, we were in the window, so. Oh, it was perfect. But it was. And that's what I was thinking the whole time, is we got to get started, so. But that's a good point. If, if I, we had talked before, I would have known some of these things. Okay, I, I know, I think we all probably want to get home. It's uh, been a long day. Anything else to wrap it up? Any I just want comments? to thank everybody for helping us meet these targets uh, and coming out and helping uh, meet the quals on the district for me. I appreciate all the help and good work uh, for those of you visiting and my, my own guys too, thanks. And we'll get this uh, AAR, this roll up will be in the final package. As we all know, this is interagency and it's been a big deal. So. I know my boss and I think all of our bosses want, want to look at this and, uh, and it'll be in the package for next year.